Welcome to Take the Lead Radio with Dr. Diane Hamilton, where she interviews some of the most successful leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and other individuals who will inspire you to take the lead in your career and personal life. And now, here is Dr. Diane Hamilton. I am here with Dr. Daniel Goldman, who is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Emotional Intelligence and Social Intelligence, The New Science of Human Relationships. He is an internationally known psychologist who lectures frequently. He does all the work that you hear about in the area of emotional intelligence. So if you know about emotional intelligence, it's because of Daniel Goldman. So it's so nice to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Diane. Well, it's my honor, actually. It's funny to me because I had never really known too much about emotional intelligence when I was going through my doctorate. And I had talked to one of my professors about wanting to look at uh, the factors that influence uh, sales. And he assumed I meant that I was going to uh, study emotional intelligence. And I had no idea what he's even talking about at the time. And, oh, is that right? Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. And I go, oh, oh, yeah, okay. I just kind of talked along with him. And then later I looked it up. I'm like, wow, this is the coolest thing. I didn't know about it until then. And then now it's such an, uh, ever, I mean, you can't go anywhere without people talking about emotional intelligence. Did you think you'd have that kind of impact that you've had to make it so popular in the mainstream? Well, no. <laughs> you know, when I when I wrote the book Emotional Intelligence, I was working as a science journalist at the New York Times. I, although I do have a PhD in psychology, mm-hmm. and um, I thought, well, I, I actually stumbled upon the concept in an obscure journal with an article written by my friend Peter Salovey, who's now the president at Yale University. And I thought, you know, this is such a great concept. And so counterintuitive. Sounds like an oxymoron. Emotions and intelligence, <laughs> right. uh-huh. they don't go together. Uh, and um, But I thought, what a great phrase, and I'll explore it, unpack it. And also, I was trying to uh, relate brain science to it, which had, had not been done. Uh, but I've been covering a lot of studies about emotions and brain. Affective neuroscience was the hot new thing then. So when I wrote the book, I thought, well, I better get another proposal out because I doubt anyone's going to read this. But Mm -hmm. I also had the thought, you know, someday I hear two people use the term emotional intelligence and they both know what it means. I'll have succeeded. And (laughs) by now it's certainly succeeded. It certainly has. And you you really had a great TED talk. You've done a lot of things to get this known. And anybody that's taken a business class has read you know everything in terms of leadership there's just so much that you've researched and you mentioned Salovey and uh, I think there's there's several researchers which I I think I think is kind of um, challenging sometimes in the classes I teach because a lot of people uh, define it just a little bit differently or they have different components associated with emotional intelligence um, just just a slightly yeah. different like for, for my research I was looking at uh, Baron's model just because I was dealing with stress and sales and he had stress management and then some of sometimes you'll see different components I, I think that yours is probably the one that is easiest for people you know in terms of um, understanding because it all is, is very easily spelled out but I, I talked to you a little bit before this, uh, we got before we got on the air, but it, you you had five components, and now there's really four basically uh, main four areas that you consider part of emotional intelligence, right? Yeah. Well, uh, there was a fifth. It was really motivation or drivers, but mm-hmm. we realized that was a kind of self management. Mm-hmm. So the right. four parts of self awareness, self management, uh, empathy, or social awareness, mm-hmm. and then uh, relationship management or social skill. Uh, those are the four parts, and within each of them, I, I went back to my actually my research from graduate school with David McClellan, who was my main mentor at Harvard in graduate school. He was uh, developing what's now pretty common in business today. It's competence modeling, mm-hmm. where you you take your top ten percent performers and you compare them with people who are just average, and you try to see what abilities or competencies you see in the stars that you don't see in the average. So uh, we found that there are about a dozen uh, competencies that show up over and over again that are based on emotional intelligence. And I've been working with that uh, set of of 12 uh, abilities because they're learned and learnable. This is the good news for anybody. Right, right. And that's huge. And you know what I think is interesting when you 
deal with any self-assessment, and I've been dealing with that because I created an assessment recently to, to measure the factors that um, impact curiosity. And I, I think it's very challenging for people to to look at themselves, um, you know, in a way that where they, they, they aren't influenced somehow. Do, do you think it's possible to get a, a 100% accurate measurement of emotional intelligence? Well, uh, we find that other people's view of you it, as an aggregate is a much uh, mm -hmm. better uh, way of judging because we have our blind spots we have our you know our our, our hubris our yeah. things that we think we're good at we may not be so good at as other people see our actual behavior so we have this uh, assessment the emotional social confidence inventory it's mm -hmm. a 360 right and we find that uh, if you ask people who know you well whose opinions you respect and trust to evaluate you anonymously, you actually get a, a very good view of what your strengths are and where your limits are across all 12 competencies. That I think is, for example, for coaching, that's extremely valuable assessment because you don't get that kind of information in life. People won't be straight with you. That's uh, right. You know, if, particularly if they work for you or, you know, they work with you or they're married to you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely <laughs> Whatever not Whatever it may right? be. Yeah, but if, if they can, evaluate you on an objective measure and do it in the, where they know they're anonymous, then have that data aggregated and fed back to you. That's that's a much better indicator. You know, it's interesting to look at some of the leaders uh, and whether they have high levels or low levels of uh, emotional intelligence. And um, I, I have a couple courses I've taught where students have to, to judge whether they think uh, Steve Jobs was high or low on the emotional intelligence scale. Uh, what would you say of uh, anything you've read? I'm sure people have asked you about different people. Was he one that you've ever had a chance sure. to look at? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't think emotional intelligence is one thing. I think mm -hmm. it's 12 things. Yes. And you can be good at some and not so good at others. I mean, Steve Jobs was fantastic at achievement motivation. He really had goals and he got there and knew how to get there. Uh, I don't think he was always so good at empathy. Right. Uh, you could say that uh, Bill Clinton was the reverse. He, he, I, I met him once, and he was fantastic at empathy. Hmm. He thought you were the center of the universe when you were talking to him. On the other hand, he wasn't so good at impulse control, uh, yeah. to say the least. <laughs> so, uh -huh. you know, uh, I think it's helpful to break it down, not to think of emotional intelligence as, well, you either have it or don't, but really in what way are you emotionally intelligent? I think that's much more useful. And I think a lot of people are always looking for quick tips on how to improve in terms of emotional intelligence. Is there one book that you've written or one book uh, that people you think should uh, follow to get guidance? Or I mean, some of these are good about explaining it, and then others are good about team yeah. activities. What, what If you're trying to improve your level of emotional intelligence, is there one thing to go to for help? Well, uh, the one book where, where we go into that in some detail is... Um, Primal Leadership. It's a book I did with my colleague Richard Boyatzis and mm -hmm. Annie McKee uh, for the Harvard Business School Press. Mm -hmm. And that book is still in print. And it goes into, uh, uh, it describes a process whereby you can generally improve your emotional intelligence. But also, I'm working now with Keystep Media, which has an online uh, learning platform. Uh, which is probably more practical for, for more people. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the point is really that it's not like uh, learning calculus. It's not like, uh -huh. you know, yeah. the, the way you learn in school. It's a different mode of learning. It's skill building, really. And it takes practice and it takes focus and it takes ideally someone looking at you and seeing how you're doing who can help you see where now you can improve more. You know, you're talking about learning online, and it, uh, I looked at your sites and some of the stuff you're doing now. You're offering these coaching certification programs. I, I was; these are really intense. Twenty-seven weeks, right? With well, one, uh, without it, it, practicum and thirty-nine to fifty-one with. Uh, yeah, so there, it's a combination of actually uh, working with a group uh -huh. or going through it with you uh -huh. online, because some people are in, you know, Asia. Right. They're not necessarily here <laughs> uh -huh. or in South America. Uh, and, uh, you know, that takes, uh, you know, several minutes a day over time. And then you actually coach someone, you get coached, 
Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, there's a three day and a five day in person meeting. So we try to create it so that people who have a full life, mm -hmm. you know, maybe our coaches already uh, can also go through the certification in a way that's not a showstopper, but actually fits well into a busy life. It's interesting all the um, different things you could do in a day to actually be a more well-rounded, emotionally intelligent um, person that ha you know has mindfulness. And now that you're dealing with this mindfulness issue in your other book, I'm wondering how much you're running into people trying to find time to incorporate all this because I think these are all really important skills. Do you, is it something that we need to spend a lot of our day to, to work on? Or is this something uh, that we could spend a little bit on emotional intelligence, a little bit on mindfulness, a little bit of, you know, on just developing different uh, parts of our character? Sure. Well, mindfulness, one thing, uh, does develop directly emotional. Self-awareness is the keystone of emotional intelligence and mindfulness is definitely an exercise in that uh -huh. and our our uh, you know my theory of the very best kind of mind training to do and mindfulness is definitely mind training is the one you'll do and yeah right the amount that you'll do <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so we suggest people start small five minutes ten minutes a day build up if they find it pleasant if they can fit it into their day not everyone can but one of the things Mindfulness is you can do it at any point in your day, no matter what else you're doing, because it really is about how you're relating to your experience in the moment, not setting time aside, but mm -hmm. rather uh, being aware of your own reactions to what's going on or your own sensations, you know, what's going on in you as well as around you. Well, when you're um, we're researching this, I was uh, interested. I was listening to your book uh, on tape uh, and. Uh, also have it <laughs> written so I was looking at kind of different ways of um, looking at your information and I'm thinking you you wrote this with your friend Richard Davidson and you were talking about how um, there was a negative connotation sometimes to mindfulness that they were looking at it as like the LSD kind of studies from a long time ago in altered states if you bring up that it, it, did you have any kind of issues with them letting you taking this as a serious area of research? Well, yes, because mm -hmm. Davidson, who's now a neuroscientist at Wisconsin, and I were graduate students in the very same program at Harvard that some years before had gotten rid of Leary and Alpert because they'd <laughs> right. been giving psychedelics to undergraduates. It's a big scandal. Uh -huh. And I think our faculty were a little traumatized. So uh, they were very reluctant to approve of our studying uh, what we, we call meditation then. We now mm -hmm. think of it as mind training mm -hmm. uh, because it's smacked of, you know, oh, no, consciousness again. We can't go there. <laughs> but, of course, that was a while ago. And now when Davidson and I went back to review the, all the literature on this, we found there's 6,000 peer review articles. Wow. Uh, we, we took the top 60, uh, mm -hmm. top in terms of, tightness of methodology, prestige of the journal. You know, A-level journals do much more rigorous reviews of articles they put in. Uh, so we preferred those. We found, you know, 1% of those 6,000 were really airtight. And when you say airtight, you mean replicable or what do you Not mean? just replicable, but for example, uh, you brought up the question of self-report. Mm -hmm. uh, what Davidson found when he did a a study with our uh, another friend, John Kabat-Zinn, who's kind of put mindfulness on the map with MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, uh -huh. uh, that if you have a, what's called an active control group where people spend the same amount of time doing something that helps them. We, Davidson created a health enhancement program where you study nutrition and exercise and you exercise as much as you as the other people are doing the mindfulness if you have an active control group, the self-report measures are good in both. And so uh, we actually don't really trust articles that are based only on self-report. We look for harder measures, biological measures, brain measures, and so on. Uh, so that's just one example of the kind of thing that we felt made a study airtight. Well, you you know, this is a different area of study. I mean, it's than what, you know, emotional intelligence, but it, you've always been kind of... Uh, interested in this type of thing from what I was uh, reading and you've worked with the Dalai Lama and some really important people in this area 
And going back to Steve Jobs, he was interested in some of this mindfulness meditation and, and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm wondering if you can combine um, like a type A personality driven successful people and still have them want to get into more meditative states. Do, do, do they go together or is this something that you Well, can... I, I think they do and they don't. Uh -huh. uh, the sense in which they do uh, has to do with, for example, Wisdom 2.0 is very popular in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. It's a yearly conference where uh, experts in mindfulness and similar uh, mind trainings talk to people who are pretty much, uh, you know, achievement oriented type A executives. Mm -hmm. And they're talking to them about the ways in which it helps you achieve, which are very clear. Right at the beginning, the benefits of mindfulness include uh, a sharper attention, better memory, better learning, uh, you're calmer. And calm and clear is the best state, internal state to take in information, mm -hmm. process it deeply and respond agilely. So, you know, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, if you go more deeply, you may not be so interested in uh, achieving. Although I was just talking to an executive at a, a very large global company who goes for 10 day retreats and he does it because he's highly stressed at work and it's a total recovery. You know, the body was designed to have episodes of stress and even trauma and then have a long period of recovery. And uh, that's fine, but we just don't give ourselves the time to recover anymore. It's one thing after another after another and for this executive that was very restorative so I, you know i think it, it can fit in various ways and be of benefit well i think some people uh are more drawn to it i, I can't remember how many hours i read that the dalai lama meditates every day but i mean certain people uh are able to do a, a lot of this type of um you know, focus and where other people are the type A type of people like you'll probably think this is funny, but I was listening to your book on double speed before I realized that I, I, I need to slow down and pay attention because I'm <laughs> doing the exact That's opposite. That's rather ironic. <laughs> yes, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I'm so, like, OK, I need this book, I, right? <laughs> I think you you may you may remember right at the beginning of the book, uh -huh. we talk about the difference between depth and scale. Right. The Dalai Lama is a professional. He's a monk. Right. He lives in a culture that understands the value of supporting someone like him, a monk or a nun, mm -hmm. to meditate full time because they become very uh, nutritious people. It's great to be around them. Our, our culture is not one of those cultures. Uh -huh. uh, our culture is a very achievement oriented, uh, materialistic culture. And uh, what's happened is that the depth in these kind of interior disciplines uh, you find in cultures like the Dalai Lama's, uh, but very few people go that depth. Here in the West, uh, it's gone to scale. You know, there are mindfulness apps, there's mind training, uh, you know, there are meditation pods in companies. Yeah. Uh, and it's available to a much, much wider range of people than is ever true in Asian cultures, but they don't go as deep. But they still benefit. The benefits are there at every level. They're just different. Well, you say there's benefits, and you mentioned brain scanning to look at the amygdala and how it recovers from stress, and you, you cover some really interesting things in the book. Um, what I'm interested in also is that you said that some types of meditation works better, some doesn't. Not everything is uh, what the media would hype it to be. And... Um, what what type works for you the best? I mean, is there do you fall into oh. what most people would would pick, or are you off on a are you an outlier somewhere? Oh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm kind of industrial strength, uh, a little bit uh, fanatical about it. I uh -huh. started in uh, college because it helped me, uh, you know, stay calm. I was pretty jittery. Uh, I started with TM, which is a kind of mm -hmm. commercial brand, and then I uh, got a Harvard Traveling Fellowship to Asia, and there I encountered uh, other methods. One of them is it's called insight, uh, and that's uh, mindfulness actually comes from that tradition. And then uh, slowly I graduated to kind of a cousin of that, a Tibetan version, and I've been doing that uh, in recent years. But, you know, that's just my taste. I, you know, it's like there's a big menu. It's like foods or sports. Uh -huh. You know, do you like, uh, you know, marathons or do you like tennis? 
<laughs> right. it's very personal so, yeah but but did you find that there was some things that were hyped quite often that really just don't do well well for people i mean I, what i did notice is this that uh many of the teachers who have come to the west were were not seen by uh people in their own profession in asia as being that particularly advanced however with marketing in in the west um teachers who have this aura, you know, I'm from India, I'm from Tibet, mm-hmm. uh, have been, I think, maybe uh, seen as more advanced than they actually were in their own context. And, you know, students gravitated to them because they never seen anyone like that uh, at all. So I think there are teachers and probably methods that are um, marketed well, but aren't necessarily as sound as things you can get for free uh, in Asia. Yeah, it just has so many health benefits, and um, and that's what uh, it appeals to to me when I'm reading about it. Because I mean, we all have mm-hmm. high levels of cortisol, and you what you got to deal about deal with cardiac disease, and, and, right. and it, it's it's something that it, it's. It's challenging for people to know exactly what works for them, though, I think, you know, and I think just for me, I'm obviously very hyper (laughs) person if I listen to my tapes on double speed. So the the time requirements can be challenging for people. Do you recommend starting slow, just, uh, you know, 10 minutes, a minute? I mean, where do you start and, and how much do you have to have to have it actually be beneficial for you? Right. So what's the minimum dose that will yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, pay off, basically? <laughs> right. That's such an American question, it isn't is, it? It is, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, it deserves an answer. And the answer is that we see benefits from the first few minutes of mindfulness. Uh, you know, you know, I have a friend, Mark Bertolini, who's the CEO at Aetna. And um, Mark had a horrible ski accident. He, he hit a tree and he yeah. ended up partly paralyzed and constant pain. And, you know, he has access to the best medicine anywhere, but he found that no no doctors could help him with the pain. He started doing yoga and mindfulness, and it really helped him manage his own pain. So he offered it to everyone at Aetna. And Mark is a numbers guy, and he wanted to know what are the real benefits. You, you speak about the health benefits. He He measured cortisol, which is this stress hormone. High levels of cortisol mean we're just stressed out. Right. And he found that it lowered cortisol 28 percent. People got two hours better sleep quality at night and they were uh, more productive so that the ROI, they're three thousand dollars per year more productive. Hmm. Uh, It was a fantastic ROI, he found. And the health benefits we discovered uh, when we did our survey of the the research, some of them were very startling. One was that uh, it seems that telomeres, which are uh, part of the DNA every cell has to determine how long that cell will live, seem to get longer. Uh, people who do a day of meditation who have done it, who, who are more like at the uh, long-term level, not just beginners, um, all of their the 150 genes that were assayed that activate when you're stressed and create inflammation in the body all went quiet and inhibited them. Hmm. And the health benefits, uh, we think, might be quite profound. Uh, so this is in addition to sharpening attention and feeling more calm. This is what's actually happening biologically in your body. But, you know, there's a lot of research yet to be done. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you had said you'd seen uh, less mind wandering after eight minutes. Or I was listening to some of the, the numbers. Of, exactly. You know, and, and, right. Right. And, and when you're you're doing that it's really hard to not have your mind wander at least for me because i've got 18 oh stations well i'm glad you once. brought that up <laughs> mind wandering is part of the practice uh-huh. uh, some people think oh i can't do this my uh-huh. mind is crazy that actually means you're paying attention uh-huh. to what your mind well, does your really mind always attention. wanders <laughs> no 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 you have to understand the basic repetition you know when you go to a gym and you lift weights every time you lift the weight you make that muscle a little stronger yeah the basic repetition in this kind of mind training is you put your mind on something, your breath, say. Your mind wanders, wanders all the time. That's what you know, the mind does. You notice it wandered. That's the moment of mindfulness. Then you bring it back to the breath. That's the rep. That's what strengthens the circuitry for focus. 
So you, every time your mind wanders, it's an opportunity to strengthen it. Yeah, I, I always thought you had to co- try to completely empty your mind, and that was just yeah. That's so a common important. misconception. Uh, yeah. <laughs> common misconception. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. You cleared that up. Yeah, it totally good. wasn't possible for me yeah. at least. So th- that's good no, to know. it's not possible for anybody. <laughs> well, okay. I'm feeling a little better about that. I, I'm I'm so interested in the way your mind works, though, because you, you go towards the the topics that really interest me. I mean, I'm always interested in anything that's brain related, and so you're trying to get people to be you know uh just smarter and better in in so many different ways you know and i think that i I guess i'm curious where you'd go next i mean are you interested in in just figuring out why we dream i mean what what next part of the brain are you that's very interesting yeah well i can see why you've developed a measure for curiosity (laughs) you're very curious (laughs) and by the way i I remember an article in hbr by uh, claudio fernandez arose saying that curiosity is one of the competencies of the future so you're ahead of the game oh yeah. well, thank you I... yes uh, but um where am i going next uh i'm getting very interested in sort of the values dimension purpose and meaning it's intriguing to me that new hires millennials are seem to be more care more about the mission of the organization than earlier generations right and uh, I, I i find that very important and I'm, I'm really interested in looking into it it is interesting to look at the different generations and and how um they, they interact i know there's so many issues with that and that's where emotional intelligence was so great in the training and, and but you know even with all the the assessments and all the information we've learned about communication being important and why do you think we're seeing such poor engagement levels still at work I mean, people... well, uh, you know, there, there are kind of two strategies mm-hmm. for dealing with disengagement, which HR says is rampant mm-hmm. uh, in companies. Right. Uh, and one is to uh, re-engage people for the organization. Well, I guess they both have to do with re-engaging. Mm-hmm. One is to re-engage by uh, getting people to understand that their mission of the organization is meaningful and they're mm-hmm. making a meaningful contribution. That's that's the, actually the kind of the standard way of doing it. The other is to help people uh, be better able to engage at will. And I think that that's where emotional intelligence can come in and where the kind of mind training we're talking about can come in because it turns out that if you that one of the doorways to flow, which is complete immersion and pleasure in what you're doing, that's like engagement at the max. One of the doorways is um, paying close attention, mm-hmm. bringing your attention to whatever you're doing, and it's something, frankly, our culture has been very poor at. Um, you know, we've let external things, changes in fashion. The new, you know, this year's cars and the design uh, perk up our brain. But what we haven't done is what many Asian cultures have done for centuries, which is to help people train their attention so that they bring that what's called beginner's mind, that orienting response from a brain point of view that, uh, oh, look at this, this new interesting Mm -hmm. thing, being able to bring that to anything. That's what Zen is, Mm -hmm. for example. And by the way, Steve Jobs was a student of Zen. Right. He was someone who was looking anew at the same old thing. And lo and behold, he kept coming up with new gadgets that we didn't know we absolutely needed until we saw them. Yeah, see, that's all uh, very interesting to me in my research and curiosity because I think a lot of people um, just rely so much on assumptions. I found four factors really inhibit curiosity, and that was fear, assumptions, technology, and environment. And if you just already know, think you know an answer to something, you don't even bother looking into it any further, you know? And and I think that uh, that, that's been an, an issue for a lot of people. And so I'm curious if you've always been a curious person, because obviously you are now to write all of this, to do all this research. Well, How do yeah, you... I think that's one reason I kind of left psychology and went into journalism, uh, because in journalism, you know, I was at the Times for 12 years in, mm-hmm. in the science department. And in journalism, whatever catches your fancy and might be of interest to other people, uh, you can pursue. Right. Uh, you know, I found uh, psychology departments weren't that open, frankly. 
Hmm. Uh, there are two two strategies um, generally in, in companies, and I think in life. One is exploit, and the other is explore. And psychology departments, at least in my experience, want you to exploit. They want you to, uh, you know, refine a topic that's been around and add something to it. That's like a company that has a product that's making money and tweaks it every year uh, so that it keeps keeps bringing in the cash. The other is to explore. And that means to be curious, to look around, to uh, find something new. Um, Schopenhauer said, maybe you know this, genius is hitting the target others do not see. And I, I think that. Jobs yeah. was, was, you know, really fantastic at that. He may not have been so great in other ways, but that was one strength that he had. Uh, and, you know, it, it showed in, in the company. And so I found in journalism, you could explore. You could explore widely. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always found that. So now that I never thought about it, but now that you pointed out, I guess so. <laughs> <Were you, laughs> I guess I was curious. Well, you know, I, I, I think I'm interested in the unexplainable things. And you, you look towards the things that interest me, which explaining the brain, for mm -hmm. example, explaining, uh -huh. I like astrophysics. I like the, the really ones, you know, the things that are really out there that nobody, nobody really has good answers for. Are there other topics other than mind related things that just make you very curious well yeah i've, I've been um, very struck by the fact of the, the anthropocene dilemma that uh, humans are oblivious to the fact that our daily habits are eroding the global systems that support life on the planet including human life uh -huh. uh, which is why global warming is a problem it's not just global warming it's it's, uh, it's water it's biodiversity. It's all kinds of things. I, I grew up in the Central Valley of California. Mm -hmm. And in the summer, when you would drive through the valley, your windshield would just be coated with insects. Now it's not a problem. And mm -hmm. what that means is there are fewer insects. Well, that's actually not a good thing uh, for the planet. So, you know, I, I, I see that uh, from a brain point of view, our brain was developed at a time when we needed to be highly attuned to things that could eat us or that we needed to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have this very narrow perceptual range, which means the changes in the planet are too macro, too micro, too slow uh, for us to detect even if, in terms of our sensory system. And our amygdala, the brain's radar for threat, shrugs. It, it's not attuned to that level of danger, that kind of danger. And so we keep doing things collectively that actually are, are not that good for us or for our progeny you know our children and grandchildren so that's that's something i've been it'll be interesting yeah. to, it, it's, it's what younger generations since they're more interested in you know saving the well, planet kind of thing do you think we'll see a change in that uh, actually i think it has huge business implications mm -hmm. uh, i think that there is a fantastic entrepreneurial opportunity over the next 50 years namely this everything all the all the processes we use all of the products that we manufacture uh, are done in a way which when they were introduced we, we didn't know the consequences for the planet now we have a lens that can tell us what the actual impacts are and i think the great uh, entrepreneurial opportunity is to find better ways to do it and make that a marketing advantage and particularly as younger generations become uh, you know, big forces in the market. I think there will be a market force that values that. And that if it happens soon enough, uh -huh. I don't know, cross your fingers, yeah. it might just save us or help save us. Well, it, it's interesting to see what what people are learning to, to do for the future of what we, you know, whether they're learning to save the planet, what what, what kind of educational uh, opportunities are going to exist. Um, and as we talk about this, it, it brings up when, when I was the MBA program chair, uh, I, I looked at a lot of the factors of um, what we were teaching students and what people really need to know in, to, mm. to go into the workplace. And right. it kept coming back to soft skills, you know, and then the glue mm -hmm. that kind of holds things together. Everybody's getting hired for their knowledge, but fired for their behaviors and all the things you hear about. And, you know, and so as you know, as we learn 
some of the things that you're teaching us about the importance of emotional intelligence and mindfulness and even how to save the planet or whatever. How do we, you know, when, do you really think that we're going to continue to have these four year degrees that um, are all, you know, set up with curriculum the way it always has been? Or, or do you see the newer generations looking for bits and pieces of content and more, you know, certifications here and there and, and, and that type of thing? Yeah. And are we going to lose that, the humanities and the glue and the, and get, we're Worse than soft skills in general? Well, I, I don't know if you saw, you probably did see the results. It was a global survey within the last half year. Maybe McKinsey did it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they asked senior executives, which are more important, technical skills or soft skills? Mm -hmm. About 90 plus percent said, oh, soft skills. You can hire people with technical skills. So they right. asked new hires. It was the reverse. 70% said, oh, technical skills. They didn't understand <laughs> uh -huh. that, 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 that as, you, as you become a member of a team, as you organization, as you get a leadership position, you're, you're basically uh, managing people. And that takes people skills, right. so-called soft skills. Uh, and uh, so I think that that bias is possibly a byproduct of academics, mm -hmm. the academic culture. I mean, I'm a child of academics. My parents are both college professors. But, mm. uh, you know, it's blind to the role in, for example, leadership of something like emotional intelligence. It's really focused on my discipline, my subject, uh, you know, and, and – um, that's the way the curriculum in the college years go. It's interesting to me that there's a very active movement K through 12 before people go to college in what's called social emotional learning, where they teach emotional intelligence skills to kids as part of the regular school day. But then it doesn't happen in college. It happens again in certain graduate programs, business, for example. Uh, now emotional intelligence, I saw a past company had an article uh, emotional intelligence is the new black. You know, it's a given. Yeah. Everybody uh -huh. needs that. Right. Uh, and in healthcare, for example, there's a lot of attention paid to it. So again, at the graduate level, but you know that there's this black box of four years of undergraduate education, which I think needs to be rethought. And by the way, I agree with you. We should not throw out the humanities. I think the humanities are essentially another way to learn about diversity, about difference, about empathy. About understanding other people uh, but we could get even better at that we could add emotional intelligence yeah I mean it is interesting I actually serve on a board for leader kid Academy which is a, a dedicated to teaching those types of things to the K through 12 um, and I agree with you in the undergrad I would like to see more I actually had uh, somebody on the show recently talk about steam instead of stem and they're starting I, I i kept hearing stem so much teach you know the importance of uh -huh. teaching stem but they're starting to talk about teaching steam adding arts and i'm wondering if we're going to start seeing a longer acronym <laughs> start putting more and more <laughs> into, uh -huh. into the letters you know right yeah <laughs> but, well you know i i think the arts are what make life rich and uh stem alone is not enough mm -hmm. but i would say maybe the arts alone aren't enough i think there's and, you know, my father was a professor of humanities, literature, hmm. uh, which is another is an art. And but it was really about human being human, learning what it means to be human and the range of that and so on. And I, I'd love to see more emphasis on that. And it could be an anthropology. It could be in other subjects, too. Well, I think that's what I was trying to um accomplish with studying curiosity is to try and pe open people's minds up to looking at different areas and not just be so focused. I mean, some people get really tunnel vision, you know what I mean? <laughs> they just don't oh, yeah. look outside uh -huh. and no periphery. And I, I think uh, all these things that, that you write about are just so important for just our uh, development in general. Well, I think here's a common story is this. Someone will master uh, something in STEM, for example. Mm -hmm. I'll be a programmer. Uh, and then they get a job, and then they hit a wall. And the wall is that they're underdeveloped in, in human arts and getting along with people, empathizing, mm -hmm. being a member of a team. And they don't understand, or they'll get a promotion because they're so good individually, but then they top out. And then, in fact, as you said, they may get fired for a deficit in this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I, I, I find coaching uh, people in emotional intelligence uh, such an important thing because it allows people to build these strengths at any point in their career. Because, and, and this gets back to the education, I don't think we're preparing people well 
what it takes really to get to to make progress in, in a career. Uh, it's tough. And you mentioned empathy, which is such a huge part of, uh, your, you know, your research and others uh, in emotional intelligence. Uh, that can be so challenging. What do you have like uh, a tip for how people can learn to empathize? I mean, if you've never put yourself in somebody else's position, you have no way of seeing things yeah. from their perspective. Is there is there a quick shortcut to help people with that at all? Yeah, it's called being present, fully present mm -hmm. today. That's an endangered moment. In fact, there was an article on HBR called The Human Moment, how uh -huh. to actually be present to a person. It means ignore your phone, put aside your you know, laptop, be with the person, stop your thought train. You may be thinking about something else. Right. Just pay full attention to the person in front of you. That's the beginning of empathy. I think that's really important. I mean, I, I worked in sales for decades, and that was one of the hardest things, I think, for salespeople is to not be thinking about the next question that you want to ask, to actually be listening <laughs> to what they're saying. Because, that's right. <laughs> because then people feel felt, right. feel heard, and then you, have a re then you have rapport. That's right. If you're just thinking ahead to, well, what can I say next to make the sale? It doesn't happen. It doesn't. And uh, all this, all these books that you've written, all the studies you've researched, it's all been so uh, inspiring to me. It's made a huge impact on my life. I, I, the one guy that mentioned this to me, I'd never heard of it. I'm, I don't even remember his name. And I'm, he, he, <laughs> I'm so glad he ta told uh -huh. me the, the, about emotional right. intelligence because it changed everything for me. And, oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And this was, I was really looking forward to this uh, just from what I've known. And, uh, and plus, reading your latest book has been so fascinating. And it's a, a great book. This is, must have taken a little while, too. This is a, a lot of research in here. And I, I'm, I'm always been a big fan of the Dalai Lama. And some of the people you write about in here are really interesting. And I think a lot of people could benefit from reading this. I am, uh, maybe you could uh, just share how people can uh, get the book, find out more about you, uh, maybe find out more about these, uh, the training you do still in emotional sure. intelligence. Yeah. Let me, let me start with emotional intelligence training. Okay. Uh, Key, Key Step Media is where those programs could be found, from the coaching certification to individual learning uh, programs. Uh, as far as my new book, I think you're referring to the book called Altered Traits, mm -hmm. or in the UK it's called The Science of Meditation, which actually I think is a more apt title, but it reviews the science behind uh, mindfulness and uh, the other kinds of mind training that are becoming more and more popular. Uh, and uh, as far as just getting in touch with me, I have a website, Daniel Goleman, one word, uh, danielgoleman.info. Uh, send me an email. Well, this has been really interesting, and I really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you so much.